The first thing they'll ask me is how I met her. They already know how we met, of course, but that won't be why they're asking. It never is. I remember when Luke was training, he told me that you only ever ask a question if you already know the answer. Lawyers don't like surprises, least of all when they're on the record. So they won't be asking because they want to know the date, the time, the address, or the little details. They will have done their homework, I'm sure. They've spoken to Robert, my old boss, already. So they know when I arrived in Edinburgh and which day I started work. They probably have a copy of my timetable. If they wanted to, they could pinpoint our first meeting to the minute. They won't be asking because they want to know what I'll say. They'll just want to know how I say it. Will my eyes go right or left? Am I remembering or inventing? They'll be measuring my truth against the one they've built from other witnesses, gauging whether I can be trusted or whether I'm a liar. The inspiration for the Amber Fury was about the worst thing that I could imagine. Um, and for me, the worst thing that I can think of um, is to lose something of incomparable importance to you in a moment. Um, I don't deny there are other bad ways to lose things, but the idea that your loss would be casual, random and almost instant seems to me still uh, the worst thing that you could have to cope with just because of the shock element of it. Um, and so I very much wanted to write a book where somebody had experienced this extraordinary, devastating blow and, and the aftermath of that and how they coped with that. And I also really thought if I was writing about grief, which I really was, um, it kind of had to include Greek tragedy. There's no better place to see uh, grief being caused and endured and uh, to see grief bending a person out of shape, making them behave in an abysmal way, uh, causing further grief for other people um, than in the plays of Sophocles, Aeschylus and Euripides. I think so. Amber is partly set in Regent's Park. It has two main locations, uh, a place called Rankeela Street in Edinburgh, um, and Regent's Park in London. And the reason that the park appears in it is kind of mysterious, so I don't want to give too much away. But uh, we find out relatively early on that Alex, uh, the book's heroine, hero, up to you, um, is coming down to London once a week or once every other week. Um, and she is getting the train from Edinburgh to King's Cross. And then she walks to Regent's Park and then she stays here for a while doing something you'll have to wait to find out and then she walks back to King's Cross and gets the train back to Edinburgh and it's a sort of ritualistic behaviour uh, which will turn out to be very important uh, as the book goes on um, and I always planned to set part of it here because I've walked through this park so often I felt like I knew it as well as anybody could. So when they ask I'm not going to roll my eyes and tell them they're wasting my time. I'm not going to tell them that I can hardly bear to go over this again, that every time someone asks me, I have to live through it all over again. I'm not going to ask if they know what it feels like holding up the weight of everything that happened. I won't make a fuss. It wouldn't help. I'm going to take a small breath, look straight ahead and tell them the truth. I can't get nervous and start rattling on about how I didn't plan to be in Edinburgh. I won't ask them to remember what had happened to me and why I'd had to run away from London, why I was in Scotland at all. I won't remind them that I could have had no inkling of how terribly things would turn out. Besides, even if I had, I wouldn't have cared. I didn't care about anything then. I'm just going to answer as simply as I can. I met them on the 6th of January, 2011 in the basement room at 58 Rankeela Street. And I wouldn't have believed any of them could do something so monstrous. <laughs>